As I headed to work, I couldn't shake the conversation my wife brought up during dinner the previous night. It wasn't the first time we touched on these kinds of topics, but lately, it seemed to be on her mind more often, and I found myself wondering why it had become so important. She had asked me to think back to how many women I had been involved with before we made our commitment to each other. Then, she wanted to know if I ever thought about them during our intimate moments or had any lingering fantasies. After five years of marriage, my honest answer was that my wife and I had built a relationship based on trust, respect, love, intimacy, and friendship. Even though it wasn't perfect, I believe those were the pillars of a solid marriage, and I assumed Sarah felt the same way. It felt like we were living an ideal life, a stable income, a strong marriage, a nice home, and the ability to enjoy vacations and good food. I'm Rob Miller, but my friends call me Robbie. My wife's name is Sarah. Growing up, I stayed active by playing football and hockey year-round, along with weightlifting. These days, I keep in shape by running and participating in a local soccer league with the occasional game of pond hockey. Sarah, my amazing wife, with her bright eyes and flawless complexion, could captivate anyone with her smile. Her charm and ability to engage in conversations on just about any topic made her a joy to be around. She was also a great listener, always giving sound advice to friends. Her friendliness might sometimes come across as flirty, but it never bothered me. Sarah knew how to keep things appropriate. In my eyes, she was nearly perfect. The only small issue we faced from time to time was her stubborn streak. When she made up her mind about something, it was tough to change her perspective, especially on matters where there weren't clear facts. Still, these disagreements rarely turned into serious arguments. Sarah and I had gotten married shortly after college, having exclusively dated for the last two years of school. She didn't have much experience in relationships before we got together, while I had lived a more adventurous life in high school and the first couple of years in college. By the age of 19, I considered myself lucky when Sarah asked about my past, and I admitted that my previous experiences played a role in our relationship. She admitted that she sometimes felt envious, realizing what she hadn't experienced. I work as a mechanical engineer in Raleigh, designing components for medical devices, while Sarah thrives as a CPA, working for a top accounting firm. Her job provided stability and occasional business trips where she mentored newer employees recently she had been traveling with a recent graduate named Tyler, who had just started his journey toward becoming a certified accountant. After their first trip, Sarah mentioned Tyler, but she hadn't really brought him up again. As time went on, I started noticing changes in Sarah. She wasn't as talkative, seemed a little distant, and had been coming home later than usual. During one particularly passionate evening, when she undressed me with more urgency than usual, something felt different. Afterward, I went downstairs to start dinner, planning to bring up my concerns when she joined me. When Sarah finally came into the kitchen, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I gently approached the topic, telling her that I had noticed a shift in her behavior and asking her what was going on. I reassured her that my love and trust in her hadn't changed. She smiled playfully, making light of the situation, and joked that when people start conversations like this, it often spells bad news for a relationship. She assured me that it wasn't anything negative, quite the opposite, actually, and that what she had to share would make me happy. Despite her attempts to put me at ease, I still felt uneasy. I asked her about the recent changes I'd noticed in our relationship, not just the physical connection but emotionally too. That's when she brought up our passionate moment earlier and asked why I was feeling concerned. I explained that it wasn't about that, it was about how things had been feeling different for a while now. At this point, Sarah's mood shifted. She seemed defensive, almost as if I'd hit a nerve. When I asked her why she had been acting differently, her tone grew sharper. She suggested that if I wasn't satisfied with her affection, maybe I needed to figure out what was wrong with me. That sudden defensiveness felt off, and I pressed her for the truth. Something was bothering her, and I needed her to tell me what it was. I stressed the importance of honesty and clarity. Sarah's tone softened as she apologized explaining that she hadn't meant to react that way. She expressed the need to share what was going on, emphasizing her love for me and how much our life together meant to her. Sarah spoke sincerely, with confidence and tenderness in her voice. Still feeling concerned, I asked her directly if she had been unfaithful, fearing the worst. Sarah, sounding both offended and resolute, 
denied any cheating or betrayal. She reassured me that she respected me and our relationship, despite my worries. She encouraged me to listen without jumping to conclusions, explaining that she wanted to talk about something important and stressing the need for an open conversation. Sarah reiterated her commitment to our marriage, expressing her desire to have a future together. Raising children, growing old as partners, and spending our lives side by side. She asked me to listen carefully to what she was about to say, as it wasn't easy for her to share. Then she clarified. Sarah had been talking about Tyler, her colleague, with whom she had gone on several business trips. Along with those trips, they'd had lunches, attended happy hours, and even shared a dinner last week. Sarah flatly stated that she hadn't cheated or started a romantic relationship with him, but she admitted her actions had crossed a line. I want to be clear, Sarah said. I spent time with Tyler without telling you, and that was wrong. But I want you to know that I don't love him. Yes, there was some flirting that seemed harmless at first, but it became something more complicated. It never turned physical, but it did make me question things. Her words stung, but I listened. I asked her if she had feelings for him, worried about the answer. She sighed, visibly upset. Rob, he's younger, fit, and attractive. But it's not love. I never wanted a relationship with him. Still, the attention. It stirred something in me. I've been struggling with it. I pressed her further. Then why did you let it happen? Why the flirting? What did it mean to you? Sarah looked down, ashamed. I don't know. It made me question whether I missed out on something before we got together. You had your experiences, and I guess part of me wondered if I'd missed mine. But it was never about wanting to be with him. It was just attention. I could feel my heart racing, but I forced myself to stay calm. Sarah looked at me, her eyes filled with regret. That's why I need to be honest with you, she continued. I've been thinking about having a one-time experience with him, not because I love him, but because I feel like I need to have it before we move forward and build our life together. I know this is hard to hear, but I don't want to keep anything from you. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You're asking me for permission to cheat on me? Sarah flinched at the word, but she didn't back down. Rob, it's not cheating. I love you, and I want to spend my life with you. But I've realized that this feeling won't go away unless I deal with it. I don't want to do it behind your back. I'm telling you because I respect you and our relationship. I stood there, stunned, struggling to process what she was saying. You think this will help us? How can you believe that? Her face paled, and she realized how much she had hurt me. I don't want to hurt you, she said softly, but I need to be honest with myself, too. I've thought about it a lot. I love you, Rob, more than anything. This isn't about love. It's about closure. My head was spinning. I couldn't make sense of it. Rising from the table, I looked at her, my heart aching. I hoped she would realize what she was asking me, the damage her words could cause. I needed her to understand the weight of what she was saying how this could tear apart everything we had built together. She could see the pain in my eyes, and she began to apologize again, trying to explain herself. Rob, I'm telling you because I don't want to lie to you. I know this is painful, but I believe we can be stronger if we're open with each other. But all I could think about was how I had once crossed a line emotionally, and how it had hurt her. A while back, I had gotten close to a colleague. We'd exchanged a few flirtatious texts, shared walks after work, and once, we kissed after a company event. I confessed it to Sarah, and the pain it had caused was clear. Though nothing physical had gone beyond that, the emotional betrayal had left a scar. Now, looking at Sarah, I could see how conflicted she was. But her request felt like a blow I couldn't recover from. I told her I understood where she was coming from, but that didn't lessen the hurt. The fact that she needed my permission to do this felt like a betrayal and I wasn't sure our relationship could survive it. I admitted that learning about her actions had shattered the trust one once had in her. Bitterly, I shot back, Fine, Sarah. Maybe I'll go seek a meaningless fling of my own, and then we'll see if you still feel the same. With those words hanging in the air, I abruptly stood, grabbed my keys, and headed for the door. Rob, please. Sarah called out, her voice pleading. Please reconsider and come back. I couldn't. Sarah, you're fooling yourself if you think this will help us grow stronger. 
I can't understand how you expect me to accept this betrayal and just carry on like nothing's happened, all while claiming you love me. The truth is, we'll never fix this trust if you go through with it. If you continue this, it's the end of our marriage. Do you realize that? Without waiting for a response, I walked out, leaving her words lingering in the air. I made my way to my car, desperate to put some distance between us. Behind me, I could hear Sarah's voice, still pleading, Rob, no, please come back. But all I felt was a mix of anger and pain as I looked back at her in disbelief before driving off into the night. It was overwhelming, shock, confusion. All of it hit me hard. Seeking some peace, I decided to check into a nearby Hilton hotel. I didn't want to deal with the emotions. So I spent too much time in the hotel bar, trying to drown out the turmoil with alcohol. Eventually, I dragged myself back to my room and collapsed onto the bed, still unable to fully process that Sarah thought this whole situation was acceptable. Ignoring her calls and voicemails, I lay there, stunned. How could she claim to love me while insisting on something that went against everything we vowed to each other? I knew Sarah could be stubborn once she made up her mind, but this wasn't the time for it. For a moment, I considered just giving in, letting things stay as they were. But I feared it would be a mistake, one that would destroy our marriage. I had to make her understand the weight of her actions before it was too late. But even as I thought about it, doubt crept in. Maybe it was already too late. Even if I managed to convince her this time, how long would it be before she crossed another line behind my back? This would shatter whatever trust and respect remained between us and, ultimately, end our marriage. On the other hand, if I let her go through with this, I knew I'd never see her the same way again. How could I? I would always wonder if she'd seek comfort in another man's arms again. Would she grow to resent me for letting her fulfill her desires with someone else, instead of demanding her loyalty only to me? It became painfully clear that there was no good option. A sense of impending doom hung over our relationship, and something deep inside me whispered that we were already headed toward a tragic ending. Eventually, I made up my mind. My only hope lay in convincing her to reconsider and agree to attend counseling with me. Together, maybe we could dig into the root of her desire to seek intimacy outside of our marriage. I decided to give it one last chance and marked Wednesday on the calendar as the day I would sit her down and present my case, hoping we could find a way to rebuild. Feeling the heavy weight of sadness, I called in sick to work the next morning. I knew Sarah was away. So I went back home to immerse myself in some unfinished work on the van. The physical labor provided a brief escape from the emotional chaos swirling inside me. I spent hours installing and connecting the solar panel, making sure all the electrical components were functioning and refilling the water tanks. If I had one more day, the van would be ready for the trip we had once planned to take together by Thursday. As Sarah's return home grew near, I buried myself in these tasks hoping they would help numb the pain, even if just for a little while. After spending some time carefully researching divorce proceedings and the financial implications, I put together a basic plan in case things didn't go as I hoped. I started by surveying the house and listing the things that mattered most to me, things I couldn't leave behind if the worst happened. There was a sense of urgency as I drove to the bank before Sarah returned. At the bank, I acted swiftly canceling our joint credit card and opening one solely in my name. I also closed our shared checking account and opened an individual account for myself. From the shared account, I prepaid the mortgage for the next two months, then divided the remaining balance, issuing Sarah a check for her half and placing my portion into a personal savings account. Feeling a mixture of sadness and determination, I went to a familiar pub to clear my head. I sipped a beer and ate a hamburger, mentally preparing myself for the inevitable conversation with Sarah. Around six o'clock that evening, she returned home. As soon as she saw me, her face was filled with concern and disappointment. She immediately pleaded with me. Rob, I was so worried. Please don't leave without telling me where you're going. I understand that you're hurting, but I was genuinely scared for your safety. I was okay, Sarah, I said. I used to have absolute faith in the strength of our love. But recent events have made me doubt the very foundation of our relationship. Just a week ago, I could never have imagined you'd ask me for permission to have an extramarital affair, only to expect us to carry on like nothing had happened. 
I can't understand how you can say you love me, talk about our future together, and yet ask me to agree to something like this. Sarah, I'm not questioning your love for me, but you need to understand that asking for permission doesn't change the fact that it's a violation of the vows we made. This is still a breach of trust, and you need to grasp how serious this is and what kind of damage it could do to us. Not just now, but in the long run. I paused, letting my frustration surface. If you think this is just drama or some minor issue, what I'm experiencing right now is so far beyond that. I look at you, the woman I thought I knew, and now I'm not even sure who you are. You're asking me to accept that you love me, while also asking for my permission to sleep with another man this weekend, and then come back to me like nothing's changed. Deep down, we both know that things will never be the same. I took a deep breath before continuing. Sarah, imagine if I had been intimate with someone else and then came to you, saying it was no big deal. Would that be fair? No, of course not. You know it wouldn't be. Yes, I had experiences before we got together, but that doesn't make this any less painful. She stood there, tears in her eyes. I pressed on. If I were to do something like this, you'd expect consequences. You'd probably ask me to leave, and who knows if you'd ever forgive me. So why should it be any different for you? Why shouldn't I be asking you to leave? Why do you think it would be so easy for me to just forgive you? Sarah was overwhelmed, her eyes welling with emotion. I interrupted her before she could respond. Let's be real here. Have you already made up your mind? Have you promised him you're going through with this? I asked. She tried to defend herself, insisting that Tyler wasn't her lover. But eventually, she admitted the truth. She had already planned a trip with him, starting tomorrow and lasting until Sunday evening. Hearing this, my heart sank. I looked at her, disbelief mixed with sadness. Sarah, if you go through with this, things won't go back to normal on Monday. Our relationship will never be the same. She gasped, realizing the weight of her decision. She retreated to the kitchen and sat down at the table, pleading with me. Rob, please, don't let this ruin everything we've built. You're my husband, the only one I want to grow old with and raise children with. This doesn't change that, but I shook my head, feeling the widening gap between us. Sarah, we're just not on the same page anymore. If everything you've said is true, you wouldn't even be considering this. It's clear this conversation won't resolve anything. I want you to understand something. If you go through with your plan, our marriage will be over. I'll be back Friday night, like I said. Don't ask me to stay if you're still choosing to put our relationship at risk. I sighed and continued. I'll bring dinner around 7 on Friday. By the way, what time is Tyler picking you up on Saturday? Sarah replied quietly. I told him to pick me up at 11 a.m. But Rob, you don't have to leave. I actually want you to meet him. Anger boiled up inside me. I retorted. Meet him? Maybe I should just ask you both to leave instead. Then... Fighting back the fury, I said, Sarah, you should be thanking me for not cutting you out of my life entirely. You really need to think carefully about what you're doing here because you're underestimating just how much this is destroying us. I made my stance clear. If you end this thing, tell him you're done and don't want to see him now or in the future. And if you agree to attend counseling with me to repair what's broken, maybe, just maybe, we can find a way back. But if you don't, then this marriage is over. I gave her one final request. Give me your answer on Friday night. Take this time to seriously think about what you're doing and what it's going to mean for our lives. With a heavy heart, I turned and walked out of the house, heading back to the Hilton where I had already reserved a room for the night. From Wednesday to Thursday, I stayed there, trying to make sense of everything. Knowing the gravity of the situation, I called my boss explaining that I needed a week off due to a family emergency. Although he didn't press for details, he reluctantly gave me the day off. On Thursday morning, after Sarah left for work, I returned to the house and calmly started packing my belongings. I carefully chose items that Sarah wouldn't immediately notice were missing and packed them for transport to my van. Additionally, I decided to drop off some clothes I no longer wore and didn't need for my upcoming journey. I gathered all the tools, sports equipment, and recreational items that I didn't have room for and took them to my best friend Tom's house. I also brought along a few pen and ink drawings that my uncle had made, knowing Tom would appreciate them. As we sat at the table with beers in hand, 
I explained the situation to him and laid out the options I thought I had. Tom looked at me in disbelief, shaking his head. He couldn't believe what I was telling him. Rob, there's no way Sarah would do that to you, he said. She's always seemed so in love with you. Tom questioned whether I was making the right decision. He suggested there might be more going on with Sarah that I wasn't seeing, something deeper that needed to be understood. Right now, I felt completely lost. Everything I thought I knew about our marriage had been shattered in just a week, and Sarah seemed like a different person. Her actions left me bewildered, and I was struggling to make sense of it all. Can't we just forgive and forget? Tom asked, sounding hopeful. Can't you both seek advice, maybe counseling, and find a way to move forward? I told him that I had already offered Sarah a chance to save our marriage. If she ended the affair and came back to me, there might still be hope for reconciliation. But if she went through with her plan, I didn't see any way we could recover. I had tried appealing to her reason, and now, with Friday evening approaching, I could only hope that showing love and care would make her reconsider. It was heartbreaking to think about the state of my marriage, especially when we had once been seen as the perfect couple. As I prepared for what might be my last opportunity to save us, I told Tom that I'd stay in touch. I promised I'd reach out once I had a new phone and number, and we agreed to keep each other informed. With that in mind, I went to the Verizon store to get a new phone and number, ensuring that the current phone plan was transferred solely to Sarah's name. Once I had the new phone, I felt like a piece of the practical matters was settled. I returned home and focused on finishing the van. I completed the remaining cabinet work, took care of tasks like updating the license plates and insurance, and turned my attention to the home office. I methodically removed all personal emails and documents from the computer, erasing every trace of my life in that house. Additionally, I wrote a letter addressed to our family, friends, and colleagues, explaining the situation. I felt it was important to provide an honest explanation, especially if Sarah went through with her plan. In that letter, I told the truth, that despite my pleas, Sarah had chosen to pursue an extramarital affair, and that I had warned her it would mean the end of our marriage. I never wanted to talk about it, but if it came to that, I needed people to know what really happened. On Friday, I also had another conversation with my divorce lawyer. I needed to know what to expect if it came to that. Given our similar incomes and the fact that we had no children, he explained that most of our assets would likely be split 50 50ths. While it was emotionally draining, it was necessary to prepare for the worst. One sticking point was my 401k plan. There were over $200,000 in that account, and the uncertainty about how it would be divided in the divorce made me uneasy. Sarah had her own pension plan, but the lawyer explained that its impact on the divorce wasn't entirely clear yet. After considering everything, I decided that I couldn't risk losing half of my retirement savings due to Sarah's infidelity. So, I made the tough decision to withdraw the money early, even though it meant facing a 40% tax penalty. It wasn't an easy choice, but it gave me some control over my hard-earned savings. However, I decided to hold off on finalizing any financial moves until after the weekend. Deep down, I still hoped that I could convince Sarah to change her mind and end this nightmare before it was too late. As Friday drew closer, I felt completely powerless and unsure of what the future held. When I got back to the house, I waited anxiously for Sarah to return from work. When she finally entered the kitchen, her face lit up with excitement. Rob, she said softly, her voice filled with relief. I've missed you so much. She walked over to me and hugged me tightly her eyes full of emotion. I'm so glad you came back, she said sincerely, holding on to me like she was afraid I might leave again. I couldn't bear it when you were gone. Please, promise me you won't leave like that again. I acknowledged Sarah's feelings, telling her she was right, and that we did love each other. I emphasized how important it was for us to be together. I then suggested she freshen up and take a shower while I prepared to light the grill for dinner. I mentioned that we should cherish what our marriage meant to us, and that we could focus on that tonight. However, Sarah became visibly upset when I touched on the uncertain future of our relationship. Growing increasingly annoyed, she asked me to stop questioning our marriage because it upset her. I sighed and proposed we postpone the conversation for now, suggesting we just enjoy the evening. I assured her we could talk about it later. Let's focus on having a pleasant evening, I said, trying to keep things light. 
I promise I'll stay with you tonight, and you won't have to worry about me being upset or leaving. When Sarah returned from her shower, I couldn't help but express my admiration for how beautiful she looked. She responded with a mischievous smile, hinting at what our upcoming weeks could be like. Sarah revealed that she had bought new outfits for us to enjoy, playfully teasing me before we started dinner. She mentioned she was hungry, but joked about starting with dessert first. We rushed through our meal, eager to enjoy the sweet finale, both of us pretending, for now, that everything was normal. Later that night, I carried Sarah upstairs and placed her gently on the bed. After our intimate moment, she was breathless, completely satisfied, and soon drifted off to sleep. The next morning, Sarah woke up around 8.30 a.m., signaling the start of her day. Tyler was scheduled to pick her up at 11 a.m., and I could see the guilt, anxiety, and a mix of emotions on her face. Despite the passion we'd shared the night before, Sarah's determination to follow through with her decision remained strong, and I could sense the conflict within her. She thanked me for the incredible night, expressing her love and saying, This is how I see our future together. Rob, I love you so much. I didn't respond. Sarah, sensing my silence, finished her scrambled eggs and declined more food, mentioning she wanted to save her appetite for brunch with Tyler. She said she needed to take a shower and get ready for the day. I nodded, allowing her to go through her morning routine without interruption, but before she left, I asked for a proper goodbye. I told her I wanted to understand the significance of our love and reflect on what we shared the night before. But Sarah cut me off, insisting that this was a one-time thing and it wouldn't change the way she felt about me. She urged me to stop making everything feel like it was falling apart. With a mix of anger and sadness, I pressed her. I won't leave without saying goodbye, Sarah. I stared into her eyes as she flushed, trying to reassure me. She said she still believed in our future, a future where we could grow stronger together. But her words felt empty to me. I could see the weight of my remarks hit her, and tears welled up in her eyes as she rushed to the back bathroom. After a quick shower and carefully applying her makeup, Sarah emerged with her weekend bag in hand, ready to meet Tyler. Seeing her prepared to meet another man filled me with an overwhelming sense of anger and pain. Are you okay? Sarah asked, concerned. I struggled to find words, telling her that I wished we could have celebrated our love instead. A heavy silence settled between us as she absorbed my words. She asked me not to think of this as our last night together and urged me to look ahead, to the future where we could overcome this challenge and grow stronger. She stressed that we needed to address deeper issues in our relationship, pleading with me to stop insisting that everything was falling apart. As I sat there, she asked if she should let Tyler in, hoping that introducing him might ease my concerns. My anger boiled over. Don't even think about it, I snapped. If you let him inside, I don't know what I'll do. My words hung in the air, revealing the depth of my suffering. Sarah, shocked by my response, realized further conversation would only escalate the tension. Without another word, she picked up her bag and headed for the door. I sat there, lost in thought, knowing she was determined to go ahead with her plans despite everything I'd done to try and prevent this from destroying our marriage. After about 30 minutes, feeling restless, I began moving my important belongings into the van. As I packed, I noticed Sarah's wedding rings left on the dresser. With a heavy heart, I picked them up and carefully slipped them into my pocket. Two hours later, I had loaded all my significant belongings into the van, each item a tangible reminder of the painful decision we were both facing. Overwhelmed by a mix of anger, sadness, and resignation, I knew our marriage was hanging by a thread. I wandered through the house, lost in a state of confusion. The wedding album caught my attention filled with 40 precious photos capturing memories of our wedding five years ago. Unable to contain my disappointment, I grabbed a box cutter and cut a deep cross through the plastic covering each photo, then tossed them into the fireplace. The crackling flames devoured what had once symbolized our love. Sitting at the desk, my heart heavy with grief and determination, I began composing my final letter to Sarah. Sarah, this is my farewell message. I couldn't bear to see you walk away from me and from our once cherished marriage. Your wedding rings, left behind, symbolize the abandonment of our commitments. You've evaded the reality of your infidelity in pursuit of a carefree weekend. 
It's beyond me how you could believe, without a shred of doubt, that having an affair and then returning to our marriage as if nothing had changed would be acceptable. I genuinely can't grasp how breaking our sacred wedding vows seemed like something you could justify. Your actions have humiliated and disrespected me, believing that a seemingly harmless affair over the weekend wouldn't affect how I felt about you. That's a grave misunderstanding. In truth, it meant everything. Your actions have illuminated the difference between my love for you and the love you claim to feel for me, if it ever truly existed at all. It's exposed a vast gap between what I thought I deserved and what I mistakenly believed we shared. You've hurt me more deeply than anything I've ever experienced. You took my love, ripped it out of my chest, and callously trampled on it. The first betrayal happened when you started flirting with your lover during dinners and happy hours. The kisses you shared with him only deepened your infidelity, which you wrongly believed was harmless. But the ultimate blow came when you thought I would agree to your betrayal, that I would just stand by and accept it. How could you believe you deserve this affair and that I would tolerate it? I'm astounded that you thought I'd be okay with this. I've tried reasoning with you, made it clear that our love, our marriage, and our friendship would never remain unaffected. Yet, you dismissed my concerns, calling me immature and dramatic. I begged you to stop this affair before it happened. I even offered to see a therapist and work on saving our marriage. But my words fell on deaf ears. Despite my warning that the night of love we shared would be our last if you went through with this, you chose to ignore me, assuming I'd obediently stay by your side. It's like you never really knew me at all. I trusted you so deeply that I failed to see you were capable of this kind of destruction. While I could have physically stopped you from leaving, I knew that would only breed resentment and slowly dismantle our marriage. Believing this to be a one-time incident is self-deception. If this experience with Tyler proves unsatisfying, how long before you seek another attraction? And if it's fulfilling, how long before your fantasies lead you to repeat it? These questions haunt me, underscoring the heart of the issue. I can't be in a relationship without trust, and your actions have shattered mine. I can't envision loving you again, tormented by thoughts of your presence beside me, while your mind wanders to another man. It feels like all the love, respect, trust, and friendship you once promised me have been washed away, leaving only empty words. I can't forgive you for the pain you've caused. I can't imagine ever trusting you again or maintaining any friendly connection. Just as you tore my love from me, I must cut you out of my life. There are practical matters we need to address. I've divided our property and covered the mortgage payments for the next two months. Enclosed is a check for your share of our joint accounts. I've canceled our joint Verizon account as of Monday, so you'll need to set up your own. Insurance policies and joint credit cards have been canceled as well. I've legally removed my name from the mortgage and prepared a document transferring the house entirely to you. Whether you sell it or continue living there is your decision. It's no longer my home and I won't return. As you'll notice, I sold my car and bought a van. I may eventually pawn your wedding rings for gas money. I admit, in a moment of pain and anger, I used a box cutter to destroy our wedding album. The remains are in the fireplace. If you think it's fitting, please burn them. It will symbolize the end of our marriage. I also need to confess that I've sent an email to our friends, relatives, and colleagues, informing them of your decision to pursue an affair despite my pleas to reconsider. I've given you a day or two to share your side of the story. I strongly recommend that you take responsibility for your actions as you move forward. You're free now to pursue any experiences and relationships you desire, but I urge you not to get involved with married individuals again. You've caused enough harm to innocent lives. You can end our marriage, sell the house, and move on. I leave these decisions in your hands because they no longer concern me. If I'm fortunate enough to meet someone who truly loves and respects me, I'll be grateful. Perhaps we can discuss divorce when the time is right, but for now, my focus is elsewhere. I've decided to quit my job and cash out my 401k. My sole plan now is to sever all ties with you and avoid any future encounters. When I leave, I'll take a left turn on the road, leaving memories of you behind in the rearview mirror. Farewell, Sarah. Finally, I scheduled the email I wrote to all our friends, relatives, and acquaintances to be sent on Monday. By then, I'll have moved on from my previous life. With one last glance, I turned away and walked out the door, 
hurrying away from the remnants of my past. I drove along the winding roads by the Mississippi River, deep in thought. My mind was swirling with decisions I had yet to make. I chose to trace Sarah's path, driving from the quiet suburbs of Minneapolis all the way down to the lively streets of New Orleans. Once I arrived, I'd face a critical choice about my next move, figuratively speaking, whether to take the left turn or the right. As the miles blurred by, Sarah occupied my thoughts. I kept questioning whether I was making the right choice by leaving her, but I also realized that it wasn't the time for final decisions. It would take weeks, if not months, before I could even consider the possibility of speaking to her again, let alone rebuilding any sort of relationship. Right now, my anger was all-consuming. The very idea of reconciling seemed impossible, though I knew there might come a day when that anger would fade, leaving only the desire to be with her. Only then would I be able to weigh whether being with Sarah was worth the pain she'd caused. Sarah, on the other hand, was left to explain her actions to her family and friends, those who had always viewed her as a loyal wife. How would she justify it to them when she couldn't even explain it to herself? She had convinced herself that a brief affair wouldn't affect her emotionally, but she underestimated the damage it would do. She failed to grasp the true cost of her betrayal, and now, she'd have to confront the wreckage she had created. If there was any hope of us moving forward, Sarah would need to fully understand just how deeply her actions had wounded me. She'd have to come to terms with her selfishness, her foolish belief that she could have a fling and then come back to me as if nothing had changed. It wasn't just about loyalty to me. It was about her own integrity, something she'd thrown away the moment she crossed that line. Realizing the gravity of what she had done, Sarah reached out to my best friend, Tom, hoping to find me. She begged him to pass on her apologies, telling him how much she regretted everything. Rob, Sarah wants you to know she's truly sorry, Tom told me over the phone. She says she's willing to do whatever it takes to make things right, if you give her a chance. She's promised not to file for divorce, and that she'll remain faithful from here on out. She wants to fix this. Week after week, Sarah waited for me to reach out, hoping I'd call or come back, but I never did. She held on to the hope that I would return, but my silence was the only answer she got. Then, a month after I left, something happened. One evening, Tyler opened his door to a masked man, holding a heavy baton. Without warning, the man struck him, twice, then landed a painful blow to his groin. As he staggered in pain, the masked assailant leaned in close, warning him to stay away from married women if he wanted to avoid further consequences. I think you know who the attacker was. I had kept an eye on Sarah's life, watching from a distance as she tried to move on. She claimed she'd stay faithful, waiting for me to come back. But two months after I left, she was already seeing someone else. It wasn't just a passing fling. She brought this man into the house that had once been ours. Not long after, she sold the house and moved into a smaller apartment, trying to start fresh. With the money from the house sale, she went ahead with a long-desired cosmetic surgery, breast augmentation. But fate had other plans. A week after the surgery, Sarah developed a blood clot, which led to her sudden and unexpected death. When I got the news, I didn't cry. I didn't feel much of anything at all. Had I lost the capacity to feel sorrow for this woman? The same woman I had once loved so deeply? Whether it was love, anger, or regret, those emotions were now out of my reach.